In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the 27th episode of Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast, the official podcast of the Invictus Law Firm PA, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida, the website for which is AugustusInvictus.com. We're going to post here some links, but first let me say I am here with my trusty co-host, Tiger Jin, and we are simulcasting to YouTube, Twitch, DLive, Periscope. Tiger Jin, how are things? Doing good. Good, man. All right, so first off, I need to point out that in the description to this video, you will find a host of links to Twitch, DLive, Periscope, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, everything else you can think of. You might also find there a link to our viral style. I'm going to post that in the comments shortly. You will also find a link to our newsletter so that you can subscribe there. I think we've got some kind of problem here with Restream though because it is not looking like uh, there's any activity whatsoever. So Tiger, let's, uh, let's test some levels, man. All right. Um, just do some, talking. Of that, some of that chit chat stuff people do. Yeah. So uh, you wanted to talk about abortion cases. We said last week we were going to do that. Yes. <laughs> Tiger remembered. I completely forgot. So here we are. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> That's what I spent the weekend doing, and so I wasn't gathering up uh, news cases um, although I do still have some old written house news that is quite interesting and still relevant all right, doing all right. And so I yeah. wasn't, those prosecutors let me send you the thing they are not they're interesting people isn't he scheduled for trial in like two months Last I checked. Yep. Yep. What a time to be alive. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I believe his uh, trial was in November. Okay. So th three months. Yeah. Um, the McMichaels are going to be in October. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Uh, Who are those? Who are the McMichaels? You mean the McCluskies? No, no. I thought McMichaels. they got pardoned. McMichaels. McMichaels are the ones who... Uh, who shot Ahmed Arbery. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm tracking. I think there's a big case this month, but not that I remember. I don't know. I feel like there is, but I, I don't remember it. All right. So what is going on with uh, with Rittenhouse? Did you have an article uh, Okay. On yep. I just spammed your Telegram chat with it. It it is Kenosha prosecutors are demanding the names of everyone who has donated to Kyle Rittenhouse to bar them from serving on a jury. Well, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in light of what happened with George Floyd, I'm sure the prosecutors saw that and were like, well, that could work the other way real fast. Yeah. What is interesting about this, uh, though, is that I just can't get that video out of my head where the prosecutor was arguing, like literally arguing, not lawyer arguing, but like back talking the judge and about and just all upset that the judge would not get revealed to the prosecutor where Kyle Rittenhouse was staying. Yeah, I remember that. That's what I keep thinking of when I see this. Prosecutors have demanded that judge force Cal Rittenhouse's defense team to turn over the names of everyone who donated to his legal funds or purchased the team's merchandise. Yeah. I don't know. I think from what little I know, from just what I'm hearing here and seeing in this article, I think that sounds like a reasonable request. But at the same time... Would it see? He wants all of the names of everyone. They have not formed a jury pool yet. So if he 
if he's concerned about bias on the jury, wait until you actually get a jury pool, then ask the jury. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. So what they should do, the proper motion would be not give me all of the names on this list, which most of 99% are going to be irrelevant, but once we have a jury pool, can we make sure that none of these names are on that list? Yeah. Well, you should probably call the defense attorneys and tell them that's your argument. <laughs> I, I think you're right, man. All right, let me... I just had it. I just had it. All right, here we go. This is uh, Business Insider? Interesting. Kenosha yeah. prosecutors are demanding the names of everyone who has donated Kyle Rittenhouse to bar them from serving on a jury. Prosecutors have demanded that a judge force Kyle Rittenhouse's defense team to turn over the names of everyone who donated to his legal funds or purchased the teen's merchandise. In an August 17 court filing reviewed by Insider, prosecutors said it's likely that some of the people who donated to Rittenhouse are residents in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and therefore potentially part of the jury pool for his trial. The 18-year-old is set to stand trial in November, there you go, on charges of killing protesters Anthony Huber and Joseph Rosenbaum, as well as severely injuring Gage Grosskreutz last summer at a racial justice demonstration. Rittenhouse, who has said he shot the men in self-defense as they chased him, quickly became the, a right-wing cause célèbre. He drew in enough donations to cover his $2 million bail. His family has also been selling Free Kyle t-shirts, beanies, and other swag. Through the website FreeKyleUSA.com, I can't believe swag has become an actual word that is <laughs> used in business articles. That hurts me to, to read that like it's a real word. <laughs> Anyone who has donated money to the defendant's legal defense funds or purchased products from his family's website, FreeKyleUSA.com, is objectively biased and should be stricken for cause from serving on the jury in this case. Now that's an interesting perspective. You could also say that anyone who has donated to a political campaign is objectively biased. By that logic. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically, Binger requested that the defense turn over the names of those who have donated to or bought from FreeKyleUSA.com and the Milo Fund LLC, which is run by Rittenhouse's mother, Wendy. Binger also requested the names of donors to Hashtag Fight Back Foundation, a nonprofit launched by Rittenhouse's former attorneys, the conservative lawyer John Pierce and the conspiracy theorist Lynn Wood. <laughs> Not biased at all. I love how that's how you go down in history. I mean, that, you know, Lynn Wood ha literally has a street named after him in Atlanta. I mean, it's like, there's Linwood Avenue, and now it's conspiracy theorist Lynn Wood. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's amazing how these sound bites are... Uh, anyway... I can't even right now. So the hashtag fight back found it. Why does that matter? I, I mean, was the hashtag Fight Back Foundation specifically launched for Rittenhouse's defense? Or is that something run by Pierce and Wood? Because I don't see how that would be relevant. Unless it were specifically launched to support Rittenhouse. Oh, <laughs> keep reading. Though the hashtag Fight Back Foundation was originally launched to support Rittenhouse... It pivoted to funding efforts to litigate unfounded election fraud claims after the 2020 presidential election. Ooh, so now they're going to start tying Rittenhouse to election fraud claims. Interesting. Uh, it's like a dystopian novel every day we read this news. I know, it, it's... Rittenhouse's family has since cut ties with the organization and has said they never received a full accounting of all the money that was raised in Rittenhouse's name. So they've called him a conspiracy theorist, talked about his election fraud conspiracy theories, trying to link it to the murder trial, and now he's a fraudster because the family never received a full accounting. Wood has told Insider that the foundation kept detailed financial records and never mismanaged any funds. It's almost like insider has some kind of axe to grind against lynn wood 
Now, this bit, I do remember the news about this. Um, and if I, if I remember correctly, it wasn't Wood. It was the other attorney that was representing Rittenhouse at the time. Yeah. And that was like doing all this shady stuff with money and, uh, and other things. And Allegedly. Pretty, yeah, yeah. And, and um, from, from what we're hearing about it, from the news and commentators, Kyle Rittenhouse, he broke off from this other attorney. I wish I could remember his name. Was it? Was it Pierce? I think it was saying yeah. his name. Pierce. I think so. Because Pierce would, Linwood was never going to show up in court representing Rittenhouse. That, that wasn't his role in the representation. It was going to be uh, this attorney, Pierce. And just Rittenhouse, he, he was starting to get word that Pierce was not exactly an experienced criminal defense attorney. And and wasn't all that great and just and after this money thing just left left him and now i do know for a fact that robert barnes is part of his defense team um but he has uh, another attorney other attorneys with him doing it because mm-hmm. again i think uh barnes is m- more kind of in wood's role here kind of a a uh, publicist popular face yeah 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 well that's an interesting job to have barnes is also doing the vaccine lawsuits we'll talk about that later tonight um chase grom is asking is there precedent for this so not really yeah um i mean not to my knowledge i should say but crowdfunding is actually a really new development in legal ethics. Um, it's something I've had to ask about too. Back in the day when we were doing that sort of thing, I had to call the bar and ask them about this. Um, a lot of states don't have uh, Supreme Court opinions on whether crowdfunding is ethical, quote unquote, or not. Uh, so it's kind of a new area. So I don't think there is precedent for it. Number one, because crowdfunding is so new, most lawyers don't even touch it. Because there, it's a gray area where you don't know, is the bar going to have a problem with this? Are they not? Um, and because it's so new that lawyers aren't doing it, it's certainly so new that there are, there are no appellate opinions addressing this. Um, this might be the first of its kind, certainly the first I've ever heard of, where prosecutors asked for the crowdfunding names on a legal defense fund. Totally new. From Have you ever heard of that, Tiger? No, no. And I'm wondering if he's asking about, um, more specifically about uh, asking for the names of everybody who yeah. did whatever before you even form a jury pool. <laughs> yeah, I think that is the question. And that's the thing. I, I've never heard of anything like this. And even if they had formed a jury pool, again, I still have not heard anything like that, where you could, well, not that he can't, but that no one, I just don't think anyone's ever tried it before. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that goes because if they are able to dox every single member, every single person who donated to that fund legally, um, legally dox them, I think that is going to have a huge effect on whether defense attorneys do crowdfunding in the future, nationwide. Um, uh. He says they allowed a BLM activist to serve on the Chauvin trial with no repercussions. Yeah, and that's exactly what I'm saying. I I think that is exactly why the prosecutor is doing this. Because everybody saw that, and then it didn't get overturned. And prosecutors are like, well, that could go the other way real quick. Um, We better make sure that no Rittenhouse supporters are on there. Because (laughs) have you seen a movie, or I mean a, a movement of, I can't even remember their names. Uh, you know, all due respect to the dearly departed. What are their names? Huber, Gross, Crutes. Oh, yeah, those uh, guys that got shot. Yeah, the guys <laughs> that got shot. Yeah, thank you. Have you seen a huge movement? Like, are they painting murals of those guys? Like, you're not going to get Huber sympathizers on the on the jury. I don't think that's a concern. The real concern is how many people in Kenosha, Wisconsin, are going to be like, those guys got what they deserved. I'm going to get on this jury and I'm going to free Kyle Rittenhouse. 
that is a real concern for the prosecutors. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. Yeah, not, like, like I said, not my issue is doing this preemptively before there's even a jury poll. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can fully understand asking this on a jury questionnaire, but you know, <laughs> going and, and doxing well, everybody in the country. Before. Yeah, I, I could even <laughs> see asking the judge for it even beyond the jury questionnaire, asking the judge, or moving the court rather, to say we need the names, or at least we need the court to review the names in camera and see whether any of these jurors are on this fundraiser list and they lied to us. you know, Because if, if you put that in the jury questionnaire and they say no, and then the judge reviews the list in camera and, oh, it turns out you are on that list, that would be... A serious problem for that juror, potential juror. Yeah. Um, but yeah, beyond that, it's clearly like you said. You know, we saw that video where he's wanting to dox Rittenhouse and get him killed. Um, we might have been booted. Really? Yeah, I heard a beep, and like <sighs> as soon as I tried to talk, this. This is most egregious. This is most egregious. I do not have time to do this every couple weeks where they just kick us off willy nilly and we gotta start all over again. No, it's this it's is playing. most egregious. I do not have time to do yeah, this. See? It's Was playing. it like your connection or were you talking yeah, it says you paused and came back. Yeah, no, it's I don't know. I don't know. Let me, you know what? We're gonna play this um we're going to play this video. Tiger, you might want to go to YouTube or wherever you watch this program to watch the video. Because <clears throat> um, I don't know whether I sent it to you, but this is important. We talk, We mentioned last week that the shooter of Ashley Babbitt was cleared of any misconduct. Well, immediately after that, he's all over the news, revealing his identity, calling himself no a hero. Way. Oh yeah, yeah. Nobody He's saw that coming. Saying, like, oh yeah, I was the one that shot her. Dude, are you serious? You're joking, right? Yeah, of course he's. Yeah, you're joking, right? You're. Are you pulling my leg? I can't. It's my Asperger's. I can't tell. Yeah, yeah, dude. He's all over the news. Yeah, I shot her. It was self-defense. She was turned sideways, but they teach you to shoot for center mass. No, I couldn't tell if she had a weapon. I mean, amazing. Do, yeah, go to YouTube, start watching the video. We're going to play it right now. And while we are doing that, I'm going to um, check the internet connection and stuff. Be right back. Let's watch okay. this video. Your name has been battered about on the internet, but you've never been officially publicly identified. Do you want to tell us who you are? Uh, my name is Michael Bird. I'm a lieutenant for the United States Capitol Police. For months, he has lived in hiding, he says, over this moment. His decision to use deadly force against a rioter as she climbed through a barricaded door that leads to the House chamber. In the months since, he's been the target of threats. Could you give us the nature of some of those threats? They talked about, you know, killing me, uh, cutting off my head, um, you know, very vicious and cruel. Things. Racist it, things? There were some racist attacks as well. It's all disheartening because I know I was doing my job. Given the nature of the threats that you describe, do you have any concern about showing your face and identifying yourself? Of course I do. Uh, that is a very vital point and it's something that uh, is frightening. I believe I showed the uh, utmost courage on January 6th and it's time for me to do that now. Responsible that day for securing the House chambers, Byrd couldn't see what Americans were witnessing on their TVs, but he could hear it in the pleas from other officers. Were you afraid that day? I was very afraid. What are you hearing on your radio? I'm hearing about the breaches of different uh, barricaded areas, uh, officers being overrun, 
officers being down. Did you ever hear a call or a report of shots fired during any of this? As a matter of fact, I did. There was reports of shots fired through the house main door onto the floor of the chamber. Later, those reports would prove to be false. This video captures Byrd instructing members of Congress to don gas masks. We got a disbursement of tear gas in the rotunda. Please be advised your masks under your seats. He says officers barricaded the door, what he considered the last line of defense. I had been yelling and screaming as loud as I was, please stop, get back, get back, stop. We had our weapons drawn. There's a gun! There's a gun! Bird only is hand and gun visible. A figure trying to climb through a window. He fired a single fatal shot, hitting Ashley Babbitt. She was 35 years old, an Air Force veteran, Trump supporter, and QAnon follower. We see your arm out there for a considerable amount of time. Were you wavering? I was taking a tactical stance. You're ultimately hoping that your commands will be complied with, and unfortunately, they were not. When you fired, wh what could you see? Where were you aiming? You're taught to aim for center mass. Uh, the subject was sideways, and I could not see her full motion of her hands or anything. Um, so I guess her movement, you know, caused the uh, discharge to, to fall where it did. And what did you think this individual was doing at that, at that moment? She was posing a threat to United States House of Representatives. But an attorney for Ashley Babbitt's family disputes that. He did not respond to our request for a comment, but in a previous statement said Babbitt was not brandishing a weapon, not in close proximity to members of Congress, and was not an imminent threat of death or serious injury to anyone. Her family points out that she was not armed. That's correct. The fact that you weren't aware whether she was armed or not, did that alter the decision making? It did not. What should we make of the fact that there were other officers in other potentially life-threatening situations who didn't use their service weapons that day? Um, I'm sure it was a terrifying situation. I can only control my reaction, my training, my level of expertise. That would be upon them to speak for themselves. Former President Trump has, has talked about you and this, and this incident. He says she was murdered. What does it feel like to hear that from a former president? Well, it's disheartening. If he was in the room or anywhere and I'm responsible for him, I was prepared to do the same thing for him and his family. Would you have his back today if you were so assigned? I sure would, because it's my job. As I said, your name has, has been on the internet for some time in an, in an unofficial way. A lot of rumors, a lot of accusations, one of which is that you had some sort of political motive. Um, you, were, you were a political wow. operative. I do my job for Republican, for Democrat, for white, for black, red, blue, green. A few years ago, you were investigated for leaving your, your service weapon in a bathroom. Yes. And that's been brought up by, by those who are questioning your competency. Do yeah. you want to respond to that? Sure. Uh, it was a terrible mistake. I uh, acknowledged it. I owned up to it. I accepted the responsibility. I was penalized for it. And um, I moved on. Multiple investigations have now upheld Byrd's actions on January 6th. Capitol Police in their... Uh, press release after exonerating you said your actions potentially saved members and staff from serious injury and possible death. What was it like to hear those words, to see those words? Those words meant a lot because that's exactly what I did on that day. That was my mission. That was what I prepared for. And it's rewarding and refreshing to hear that. Lieutenant Byrd says he still loves his job and looks forward to returning to it. So that is what's going on there. Tiger, you really didn't see that. You haven't seen this guy all over the news? 
talking about this? I did not see it at right. all. That and it is surreal to see it. And um, yeah, it's crazy. It also shows the internet was correct. It was this Lieutenant Bird guy. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm putting the there's a full 38 minute interview. I put it in the chat there so you all can see. Um, yeah, the the editing makes it sound like he did this because they were storming the Capitol and screaming and talking about cutting his head off and calling him racist things. That's what it makes it sound like. But really, when you watch the actual interview, he's saying those were the reasons that he didn't reveal his identity before, that his identity was kept secret. The, the interviewer asks him, um, you know, usually in a situation where a police officer shoots somebody, they release the name. Why didn't they do that with you? And he said, well, because they were talking about cutting my head off and the guys, the interviewer says, were they calling you racist things? Oh, yeah, they definitely did that. Um, why that would mean he doesn't get his name released, I don't know. Because doesn't that happen to every cop Yeah. whose name is released and they shot somebody? You know, is this like maybe it's the first time right wingers have been saying things like that? Usually it's the left wing. I don't know. Um, it seems like a suspect motive to keep somebody's name private, a cop's name private, especially U.S. Capitol Police. It's not like, I don't know. What a suspect motive to say, well, his name, you know, people are, are talking about killing him. People hate him and they are threatening violence. Like, of course they are. That happens to every cop who shoots somebody, doesn't it? Why is yeah. this any different? I well, don't get it. Well, not even. I mean, just, I mean, you'll see here in this city about every time a cop is arresting somebody, you got a crowd there yelling at them. It, it's like daily life for a police officer. Yeah. So, a lot of disturbing things about this video and the full interview, too. The most disturbing to me, you now, like we were talking about last week, we were saying he appears to have just shot into a crowd, and or, or, even worse, he deliberately shot this woman in the neck. That's one or the other. Either he's just fired willy nilly once into the crowd, and this woman happened to die, or he deliberately targeted her and shot her in the neck and killed her when she was clearly unarmed. And it says he says in the video, in the interview. Uh, no, it would not have changed my analysis if I knew she was unarmed. No, I didn't see her with a weapon, but it wouldn't have mattered either way. You know, and what was it that I quoted? The interviewer said something like, well, what was she doing exactly? And he said she was posing a threat. <laughs> what a tautological answer. Yeah. Uh, what threat? Yeah, I mean, he specifically says she was sideways when he shot her in the neck. First of all, he's aiming for center mass. Center mass, and he shoots her in the neck? How do you do that? Second of all, she's sideways. She's not even facing him. She's no threat to any... She's not even beyond the door. He shoots her through the door into the neck. I'm. What a bizarre set of circumstances, and he's cleared of any misconduct. But clearly because there is a political motivation behind the entire thing. Imagine if they said, this guy's not clear. This guy was guilty of misconduct. Meanwhile, the FBI and the DOJ have got this massive farce, the greatest, biggest prosecution in the history of the United States, quite literally. And you undermine that by saying, yeah, the cop who shot this woman was out of line and he's guilty of misconduct and he's going to lose his badge. How badly would that undermine the entire prosecution, largest prosecution in U.S. history? It would be devastating. Because it would be saying, you know, this medieval battle you know, was not justification for shooting into a crowd and killing an unarmed person. So, that's what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, and you know what it reminds me of is this really bizarre moment, like a week or two after... Carl Rittenhouse's incident, there was a 
there was a guy who was at another riot and he went and shot and killed one, maybe two Trump supporters, like just cold blood, like, oh, we, there was audio, like, oh, we see a MAGA hat over here and went and, and shot and killed him. And the news had this guy on television and are interviewing him about his heroism and like, oh, why, why'd you do that? Oh, wow. You, know, you were so brave shooting those Trump supporters. And it, it was a bizarre thing to see because even the, the murderer, I mean, he, he was convicted of murder. He, he was um, sitting there and like in the seat. You could see it like, pretty well just sweating and nervous at his all get out there just being on camera and being interviewed calmly like he was some hero for killing these people who didn't do anything and it was the it was so clearly these leftists who happened to be in the news wanting their own Kyle Rittenhouse hero and so they went and found this murderer. <laughs> what case is this? I, I haven't seen this case. Where is it? Oh, yeah, see, I, I should have prepared for this. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure how to well, even yeah, find could, that. But. You couldn't have prepared for it. I didn't tell you I was going to play that video. So, yeah. yeah so. CG is saying if you review the shooting video, the room was secured by other police and he flagged his own team to engage and kill Ashley with his weapon. So, yeah, I've seen the videos. There are cops galore. I mean, they're everywhere. And they're clearly not freaking out. They're not, you know, fighting with all these guys. Like, yeah, they, these guys are breaking the window. But there are cops right behind them watching this go on. None of them draw their weapons. None of them you know, make any move at all to restrain these guys. Um, so, yeah, you, you think of the most nefarious possible conspiracy that could be going on when you see these things. Um, CG says he was aiming for the head. That's why he shot her in the neck. He was not aiming for center mass. Okay, now I remember this guy. It was Michael Reinhold. And he was not convicted of murder because when the police came after him, they ended up shooting and killing him <laughs> because he was shooting back at the police. Oh, well, that tends to happen. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was Michael Reinhold, and he killed one pro Trump protester in Portland, Oregon. And, to see and anyway, when so. when was this i because oh. i have not heard about this so that news article i brought up let's see was october 15 2020 hmm. yeah i don't know if you want to see it uh, <laughs> it's, it was just it's old inside. news it's about to be a yeah. year old now yeah yeah so one other thing I wanted to bring up, January 6th Select Committee probe <clears throat> expands to Trump and top officials in a wave of demands. So this probe on, oh, I, I, I just love these articles because it gets more and more outrageous. All the, Like they use the word siege just, just in a normal sentence, you know, the siege, like they're talking about Fallujah or something or, you know, like it's a news story about Napoleon taking on Jaffa. It's crazy. They just use it like it's common language. Well, of course it was a siege. Of course it was a medieval battle. <laughs> weren't, didn't you see it? The House Select Committee charged with investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol has issued a... See? Right there. They just That's just part of the sentence now. It was an attack on the U.S. Capitol. An attack at the very heart of our democracy. You don't even think about it anymore. You just read the sentence. The attack on the U.S. Capitol has issued a wave of record requests targeting communications by former President Donald Trump and his top officials in the lead up to the deadly riot. Now, see, if you're going to call it a deadly riot, all right, yeah. Yeah, at least one person died, shot by U.S. Capitol Police. But yes, I think we could agree, in a sense, 
it's a little unfair, but yes, you could call it a deadly riot. To call it an attack on the U.S. Capitol, though, that's just part of the, part of the common parlance now. It marks the most widespread list of demands since the siege, directing letters to eight federal entities, including the national... You see that? You see how they just... You just keep reading, right? They called it a siege. A siege is a... It's a war term. You have surrounded the building and laid siege to it. And now the media uses this. This is NPR, by the way. The media uses this as just, of course that's what happened. We're just stating it, matter of fact, putting it right in the sentence, and you just keep reading. Don't even think about it anymore. The demands could be followed by subpoenas. They target communications by Trump, former Vice President Mike Pence, and other top officials, as well as the White House visitor and call logs related to the day of the attack. Other agencies also included in the wave of requests include the Justice, Defense, and Interior Departments. So this probe, and this was dated August 25th, this is what, like last Wednesday, uh, this probe is expanding. It's going beyond the thousand people that they've tried to arrest, and it's now going to members of government. So this could be interesting. Let's yeah. uh, let's keep watching that one. <clears throat> I promised we would talk about the ATL shooter. Uh, they're seeking the death penalty in that case. Of um, course. Parole being recommended, quite, quite conversely, for the assassin of Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and domestic abuse being used as a new defense strategy for women accused of any sort of crime whatsoever. One thing I didn't mention in the social media post is this. U.S., that is the U.S. government, the, you know, district, the U.S. attorney, says Brooklyn woman who aided Islamic State is arrested after skipping hearing. So this woman is called a committed recruiter for Islamic State, for ISIS. And she was arrested by FBI agents on Friday afternoon following a nationwide search. So she doesn't show up to her hearing. But what's amazing about this is the unspoken thing that's the elephant in the room here. Uh, this woman who is called a committed recruiter for ISIS is out on bond. Just free to show up at court whenever she wants. You, that's you, right. <laughs> you literally recruit. And not just like willy-nilly, like, hey, man, I know somebody in ISIS you want to go join, but a committed recruiter. Like, this is her job. She's a recruiter for a foreign enemy with whom we are at war. And she's allowed to get bond and travel throughout the United States. Meanwhile, if you are accused of being a white nationalist, you are going to be held in jail without bond. Is that not insane to anybody else? Well, I mean, at least she had a an ankle bracelet. Did, did she, though? Because they had a nationwide hunt for this woman. It Which, says that she took it off. Oh, she did she? Oh, 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 there you yeah. go. All right. Well, at least this... It's something. ISIS recruiter. Yes. Yeah, this ISIS recruiter well, had a They GPS would be a, a flight risk. Whenever they're looking at Bond... That's the primary thing they're looking at, whether this person would be a flight risk. Oh, my God. And you would think, yes, she's a recruiter for a terrorist organization, an international Overseas. terrorist organization. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All you got to do is slip out into Mexico and boom, you're on your way to the Islamic State. An ankle monitor? Like, you, you are recruiting people for a foreign state that is at war with this country, right? Right or wrong, you know, I'm not talking about... And that. I mean, do you think that she was some kind of James Bond genius who knows how to remove those things too? Well, I don't know I, what kind of ankle monitor it is, but it, yeah. a lot of I mean, times you can just, just cut that, it off. If I was a judge, that, that would be the thing I would be thinking of if it was... Um, if, a an ankle monitor i would just be like she works for a terrorist organization she can easily 
there's resources. You might have even been trained on how to remove those things. I mean, that, that's just what would go through my head. Who knows? I. It's just, it's amazing to me that you can be accused of something like that and get a GPS monitor, but if you're accused of being right-winger, you're a flight risk and a danger to the community. Without even having a criminal record. Yeah. First time offenders, even if that's if they did make any offense, it commit any offense. Because in, in most of these cases, these guys are innocent. And everybody knows their real crime that they're accused of is being a white supremacist. In this case, she's accused of recruiting fighters for a war against the people of this country. Or at least the soldiers of the country. It's surreal. So anyway, she's being apprehended. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Do you see the schedule? prosecutors also said Caesar should remain in federal custody, given that there is no longer any conceivable argument that she is not a risk of flight. <laughs> yeah, uh, now. You get it now? <laughs> yeah, for once, I agree with prosecutors. That's... Can't, so I, I, a broken clock is right twice a day, as they say. Yeah, I don't know how you defend that one. Federal public defenders who represent Caesar were not immediately available on Monday for comment. Yeah, I wouldn't be available for comment on that either. <laughs> what, what do you say to that, you know? Anyway, so there's that fun case. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, but let's talk about this. So the assassin of RFK, uh, Robert uh, Kennedy, JFK's younger brother, Sirhan Sirhan, uh, is being recommended for parole in California. California Review Board on Friday recommended that Sirhan Sirhan, the Palestinian refugee serving a life sentence for assassinating U.S. presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy in 1968, be released from prison on parole. Sirhan, 77, has previously been denied parole 15 times. The latest decision by a Board of Parole Hearings panel is now subject to a 120-day review by the Board's legal staff, during which the case may be referred to the full Board for further evaluation before a final judgment is rendered. The California governor then has 30 days to reverse the Board's action or let it stand. That process would most likely put Sirhan's fate into the hand in the hands of incumbent Governor Gavin Newsom, a first-term Democrat, assuming he survives a recall election set for September. If the governor takes no action on a parole grant, the inmate is then scheduled for release. The Palestinian-born Sirhan was convicted of gunning down Kennedy, 42, in the kitchen pantry of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles on June 5, 1968. The shooting occurred minutes after the U.S. Senator from New York and former U.S. Attorney General gave his victory speech after winning the California Democratic primary. Kennedy died the next day. Sirhan has said he had no recollection of the killing, although he has said he had fired at Kennedy because he was enraged by his support for Israel. Two members of the slain senator's family, including his son, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., sent letters to the parole board in support of Sirhan's release, the Los Angeles Times reported. Sirhan's attorney, Angela Berry, told the newspaper her client has never been accused of a serious prison violation and that prison officials have deemed him a low risk. Parole board officials and his attorney were not immediately available for comment. Sirhan, who was found guilty of first-degree murder and assault with intent to murder, is imprisoned at the R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego. Sirhan was sentenced to death in 1969, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison after California banned the death penalty, which is exactly what happened to Charles Manson, by the way. It's not in the article. It's just my encyclopedic knowledge. So, by and large, if, the, if Robert F. Kennedy's son is recommending the release, I'd say it's pretty certain he's getting out. The If parole is being recommended and RFK's own son is supporting the parole, I'd say it's pretty certain. That's about it for that. You got any comment on that, uh, Tiger? No, I mean, I, I wish I was... I should know more about that this bit of history than I do. So I'm not too familiar with the case. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I guess it's not as famous as JFK's assassination, but 
There was actually a movie about this. I'm pretty sure it was called Bobby. And it had the assassination from, like, different perspectives. Um, it was all right. But... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know... I know of it, and I know that there's a lot of conspiracy theories around it, but it's just not anything I ever really looked into. Yeah, there are. I mean, the fact that he doesn't recall anything. Yes. Uh, it's it's kind of weird, man, because a successful assassination like that, when you don't recall anything, yeah, it's, it's a weird set of circumstances, man. Kind of like uh, the Ronald Reagan attempted, uh, attempted uh, assassination, right? Which everyone, maybe not everyone, but conspiracy theorists, uh, you know, uh, would blame on George H.W. Bush. Um, you know, former director of the CIA, he loses to Reagan, becomes vice president instead of president, and then this guy comes out of nowhere and attempts to assassinate him. Like, it looked bad. The, you know, the circumstances of it. Same with the RFK assassination and the JFK assassination. Like, none of them seem like just clean kills. There's always a crazy set of circumstances that makes it look really freaking weird. All right, let's... Uh, I'm going through the comments here. There's some... There's some comments, all right. <laughs> so... Not many we can comment upon ourselves. Now, do you only do criminal law or do you also do civil law? Good question. Uh, I do both, but that's a very broad answer. Uh, criminal defense is what I mostly do. I do focus on, when I do civil law, uh, business formation. It's actually something I like to do. Criminal law is something I have to do. Like, I feel compelled to do it. It's like fate. But uh, when it comes to civil law, I like doing business formation. I like doing entrepreneurship. I like creating new things. Um, I like doing even the litigation parts of business law, um, you know, lawsuits breach of contract stuff. I like all that. I have to do family law too. Unfortunately, I've had a lot of experience in that for a long, long time. I don't like doing family law, but I do in certain circumstances, usually for people I know. But I don't know why you ask, but uh, that's the long and short of it. I try to stick with criminal law if I'm not doing criminal law, I like to do business law, and I try to stick to those things. Is this episode one hour or two? It's one, but <laughs> we're going over today um, because we've still got two articles we haven't talked about yet, but let's blow through those. First of all, Georgia prosecutor confirms plan to seek death penalty in Atlanta spa shootings. So you remember this is all about white supremacy, uh, this guy goes around shooting up Asian-run day spas, and my god, obviously this is racism. Turns out it wasn't racism, it was about sexual suppression or something like that, but in any event, they're seeking the death penalty. Georgia prosecutors affirmed on Monday their intention to seek the death penalty in... At, that's today, Monday, by the way. <laughs> their intention to seek the death penalty in Atlanta's Fulton County for the suspect accused of murdering four people at two Asian-run day spas there characterizing the shootings as hate crimes. So they are still going with that angle. One of them is. So, um, like you said, this news dropped today, and I saw it too. He was also in, he was in court twice. So one, so one was for some four people who killed in one area and four in another. And one of the prosecutors, let me try and, find it here all right her name is wallace and she's the cherokee county district attorney shannon wallace last month agreed to a plea deal in the interest of swift justice and avoiding lengthy appeals she said she made her decision after conversations with survivors and families of victims long pleaded guilty to 
charges, including four counts of murder, and received four sentences of life without parole, plus an additional 35 years. Wallace said that if the case had gone to trial, she was prepared to seek the death penalty and would have argued that Long was motivated by gender bias. Hmm. But she said she... But she said during the hearing last month that investigators found no evidence of racial bias in the killings there. She noted the diversity of the victims and said Long walked through Young's Asian massage, shooting anyone and everyone he saw. So, okay, so in Cherokee County, the Cherokee County killings, he is not getting death penalty. He pled guilty to it. There I see. No, no trial. So it's Fulton County. I didn't realize these were in two different counties. Yep. Yep. Are you yeah. telling me that Atlanta is in two different counties? Or it's that... in a lot of counties. Really? It covers a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about Georgia is like all the. It has all like a, it has a lot of counties. They're all really tiny and just like a ten minute drive between each one. And so yeah. Atlanta, I think, is something like, uh, it's even how you define Atlanta, even that's tricky, but at least four counties. That's weird. Yeah, yeah Florida the counties are massive. <laughs> so, all right, so in Charity County, Cherokee County, he has taken a plea, sentenced to life in prison. In Fulton County, they're going for hate crimes. So yes. two different prosecutors, one is saying, obviously he's just shooting indiscriminately. The other is saying anti-Asian bias and violence across the United States during the coronavirus pandemic means that he was shooting Asian people. Like, how are they going to prove that? Is... Um, especially when one of the victims' names is Paul Andre Michels, which is seems not Asian to me. I, that's probably yeah. racist to say. I don't know. Delana Ashley, well, that might be, but yeah. Well, I guess we'll see. But uh, yeah, they're seeking the death penalty. That's the news there. And yeah, then, and I, I find it interesting that um. So there, there's some other news that dropped to today. Another, um, Molly Tibbetts, her killer is getting sentenced today, and he's getting a life sentence that they decide no death penalty. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting how different crimes get different results. Pure anarchy is released <laughs> upon the world. Uh, you know, when something important, whenever you read the ancient Chinese strategy manuals and governance manuals and things like that one of the common themes throughout is consistent rewards and punishments for actions and we we really just don't have that at all in america i mean even the punishment is always up to is often up to debate among the judge and jury yeah or you can plead out and so it it causes yeah like you said so it's, all, it's almost an anarchist thing that's like rolling the dice every time you walk in you know when you go to trial it's rolling the dice what's the jury going to come back with go to sentencing it's rolling the dice what's the judge going to do even when you take a plea the judge is not bound to accept your plea, and that's something they go through in the colloquy with you if you take a plea. Do you understand that these are recommendations by your attorney and the prosecutor and that I'm not obliged to accept these recommendations? In other words, I can throw this plea agreement right out the window and sentence you to whatever I want to because you're pleading guilty or no contest. And a lot of times that's just pro forma, but it does happen where a judge says, yeah, I see what's recommended, but I'm not agreeing to this. I'm sentencing you to X, Y, and Z, and it's bad because, you know, they've agreed to probation or whatever, and the judge says, no, nah, I'm putting this guy in prison because I don't like him. I don't like his history. I don't like his record, whatever it is. So, yeah, it, it could be anything. 
you know, predictability in the justice system, or should I, in the legal system, the criminal system, will just keep narrowing it down. Predictability is just, it's impossible. It's literally impossible. I, I don't think any lawyer in America would tell you with a straight face that they could predict the outcome of, of a case. Nobody can. Yeah. It's in God's hands, you know, which is why trial by combat is not as crazy as it sounds. Exactly. <laughs> Go back and listen to our previous episodes. JG is asking, did you read about the judge who is barring a mother from her son because she didn't get the COVID jab? Yes. Um, I actually yeah. did read that article. <sighs> There's a lot going on with the COVID stuff. Uh, we haven't really addressed it much. We've said Barnes, Robert Barnes, we mentioned him earlier. He's filing a bunch of lawsuits over it. Filed one in Florida recently. Filed one in Maine, I think it was. Um, yeah. Filing them all over. And I believe he says that there's even more coming. That it's, There's yeah. just a whole bunch that are going to be dropping. Well, someone's got to do it. Um, I've also heard about yeah. a person who died at their job. They blame it on the unvaccinated person at work. They're talking about filing a civil suit against this person. They're clamoring for criminal prosecution. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that very soon we are going to see personal injury tort suits where people are suing for wrongful death or whatever these liberal lawyers can come up with, uh, suing co-workers for not getting the vaccination when somebody dies unexpectedly because they blame it on the people who refuse to get vaccinated. It's, it's already happening. Like, they're already asking for it. So it's only a matter of time before some enterprising lawyer gets that. So I would like to start taking those cases to defend those cases. I think it's interesting. Um, I want to add something else about Robert Barnes' lawsuits is that he's been saying on his podcast that he's not only running these lawsuits, but he's also going to be fighting the way that courts are conducting themselves in this uh, COVID-19 thing. He wants to fight the fact that witnesses are, are having to wear masks on the stands, for example. Mm -hmm. He says that that creates bias in the jury because you got a masked face on the stand. They, they look like a criminal. Um, and th there were some other things about masks in, in the court that he was going to be fighting and uh, jury seating, having them sitting apart. They're not in the jury box. They're spread out over the courtroom. And so they got different perspectives and, and maybe they can't hear so well over there, things like that. Mm -hmm. So he says he's, he's going to be challenging all of that and he encourages other lawyers to do the same when you appear in court. <laughs> Make those arguments, fight it. <laughs> yeah, you just, at a certain point you've just got to fight yeah. and see what happens. So, yeah, I mean, I've read the articles. I, I know all this stuff's going on with COVID. We don't really talk about it on this program because it's not criminal defense, knock on wood. But, you know, one day we'll, we'll have to talk about it. Um, next week, I have it in the calendar. We were supposed to talk about abortion cases this week. I put it in my calendar for next week. So next week, I cannot possibly forget about it. So we will have that prepped and ready to go. One last comment I wanted to make before we depart for the evening. Theranos founder claims abuse by ex-boyfriend in fraud trial court oh, filings. Man. Yeah. So this woman is accused of fraud. Um, she's the founder, Theranos Inc. founder, Elizabeth Holmes. She's accused of fraud, right? And it's a technology company. They, they, all right, they claim that its technology could enable a wide array of medical tests with a few drops of blood. She's accused of fraud. The court documents unsealed two days ago say that she was accused. Uh, I'm sorry. She uh, is accusing her former boyfriend who was president of the startup, the company, of abusing her. 
So this hints, they say, at a possible defense strategy with jury selection in her fraud trial set to start next week. So this was the 28th. Oh my goodness, so it should be starting today, actually, her trial. So I, this might be oh. old news. Um, in any event, this is a very troubling development um, you know, don't get me wrong, as a criminal defense attorney, I guess you got to use whatever you can, right? I mean, think about like child molestation cases, right? Or rape cases, or a host of other cases, where you say, well, my client was abused when he was growing up, my client had this and that going on in his upbringing, he didn't know any better, He's you know, been a victim his whole life, he, you know, whatever. You give the whole, I won't say sob story, but the whole background uh, as to why he was not in his right state of mind, why the court should <clears throat> maybe not grant leniency, but have some kind of understanding as to the circumstances that, um, that caused this unfortunate situation to come about. So I get it. I get it. But there is now this thing where... Any woman accused of a crime, to kind of like any person accused of rape or robbery or murder or whatever it is, if they had a bad childhood, I mean, it's kind of become this meme, right? Like people hate the criminal justice system because they have this perception that a criminal defendant can just say, well, I had a bad childhood, and they get off the hook. Like that's not how it actually works, but that's the public perception because criminal defense attorneys just started doing this one day. I just said, well, I'm just going to argue that my client had a bad upbringing. And this is going to get us, you know, some leniency or whatever, some understanding. Maybe it'll get you sent to a hospital instead of jail, whatever kind of, a, you know, advantage they're looking for. Well, now that defense strategy is going to be, if it is a woman accused of a crime, well, somebody was obviously abusing her. Because my client would never commit a crime. Hashtag me too. Hashtag believe women. It's always somebody's abusing this woman. That's the only reason that she would ever commit a crime or, you know, commit some sort of wrongdoing. Everybody's abused all the time. Everybody's a victim. So this is an interesting defense strategy. I want to see how this plays out. I didn't care about this uh, trial before. This is a fraud trial. I don't really do fraud cases myself, but now... Now I want to file the, uh, follow this uh, case very closely. So you'll probably hear about this Theranos case a lot going forward. So those are all the articles we have for today. Tiger, you got any closing commentary for the evening? Um, well, I just, I do want to make clear in case people don't know, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, she was the, uh, if you don't, rem if the audience remembers or not, she was the girl that the media was all pumping up and saying was the female Steve Jobs and having her do these photo shoots where she was essentially mimicking famous Steve Jobs photos wearing the same clothes and stuff. And yeah, she was supposed to be this genius and everything. <laughs> she and was a this. media darling and now she's accused of fraud, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure she'll be rehabilitated. We'll see how this goes, man. Now I'm interested. I was apathetic before, quite honestly. Uh, but now I'm, I'm wanting to see where this goes. I want to see, as a criminal defense attorney, just my professional interest, I want to see what they come up with for this uh, new defense. So we will check in with you all next week. We're going to talk about the abortion cases. Um the impending overturning of Roe v. Wade. We're going to talk about the history of abortion jurisprudence in this country. So, I don't know who this is that keeps... I, I'm going to ban whoever this is as soon as I can, because this is just insanity. Block user on YouTube. There you go. That ends that problem. We've had some crazy person in the chat saying crazy stuff the whole time. It's very distracting. Anyway, we will see you all next week. Check out all the links. Um, I think, did I post the newsletter and, no, I didn't, did I? 
So we got a newsletter. We got a viral style. I was supposed to post that. I always forget to do this sort of thing uh, during the show. Oh, also, Patreon. We've been talking about doing a, a big movement for um, for this podcast. First of all, here are the two links I'm talking about, the newsletter and viral style. Uh, it's in the comments now. Second of all, Patreon, right? We've been talking about uh, putting up a Patreon, doing membership tiers, doing extra content, because we do this podcast, but that's all we do, right? We don't uh, do interviews. We don't do shorter videos. We, we don't do any of that stuff. For some reason, the link did not post. So I'm trying to find out, like, what would we add for membership tiers? What do people want to see? If you go to Emperor Invictus at uh, Twitter, you can see the survey there or just, you know, email me with it, whatever. Um, one way or another, let us know what you would like to see with the podcast and how you would like it to expand because, yeah, it's, it's the podcast for the law firm, but we're also looking to expand the podcast. So let us know and we will check in with you all next week. As always, stay in school, don't do drugs. See you guys next time.